professional race car driver Juan Manuel Fangio is eager to meet up with his friends and soak up the beautiful February evening in downtown Havana. After winning his fourth consecutive Formula One Drivers' Championship, the fifth of his career, Fangio had been invited to Cuba by the president himself to race an exhibition in front of the entire world. He had spent the day being ushered around the city with the president, who had rolled out the proverbial red carpet. It was a long, memorable day that left the driver grinning ear to ear. When Fangio stepped out of the elevator and into the bustling lobby of the Hotel Lincoln, his pals were there to greet him. As he said hello to his friends, a slight and intense looking man in a leather jacket interrupted the group, brandishing a 45 caliber pistol. Thinking it was a joke, Fangio looked at his friends and laughed. Then the man spoke. One of Fangio's friends reached for a paperweight to throw at the man. He whipped the pistol around and pointed it at him. Suddenly, eight other accomplices in the lobby stepped forward. Fangio and his friends were surrounded. Fangio now realized this was not some prank played by a fellow racer. His smile had faded and been replaced with a steely, calm expression he'd often sport while racing. Where are you taking me? The armed man didn't answer. As the packed lobby helplessly watched, Fangio was whisked out of the hotel and tossed into a waiting car just outside. Then, just like that, Fangio was gone. How did Juan Manuel Fangio go from his modest upbringing to become one of the most famous sports figures in the world? What makes his career in Formula One so special? And why on earth was he thrust into the middle of Cuba's volatile political crises? We're gonna find out. Today on Past Gas, the career and kidnapping of Juan Manuel Fangio. Big thanks to Valvoline for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. Did you know that Valvoline was America's first motor oil brand, making it the original motor oil? Since its founding over 150 years ago, Valvoline and its scientists have been innovating, creating, and reinventing formulas. One of Valvoline's newest oils is the Extended Protection Full Synthetic Motor Oil. It's their best oil yet. It's specially formulated with dual defense additive technology, which combines an innovative additive boosted with fortified detergent system, which cleans out your engine, makes it run great. I use Extended Protection Motor Oil in my Forerunner. It's a 95 Forerunner. It's getting a little bit long in the tooth, if you know what I mean. So I really have to be careful with what I put in it. I fully trust Valvoline's extended protection though. I use it every time I change the oil in it. It runs great. I haven't had any issues. And that's thanks to extended protection's 10 times stronger protection against oil breakdown, meaning as oil ages, it gets thicker and thicker due to thermal degradation. If you don't trust me, ask Rob Dom. He uses the same oil. He trusts it. I trust it. You should too. Next time you get an oil change, ask for Valvoline. You're going to thank me. Thanks, Valvoline. Well, now I'm just craving a Cuban sandwich. Ooh, I love a Cuban. I love a uh, medianoche. Oh, even better. That's my favorite. I think that's yeah. better than the classic. I think so, too. What's the difference? A medianoche consists of roast pork, ham, mustard, Swiss cheese, and sweet pickles. Mm -hmm. It's a close cousin to the Cuban. The chief difference being uh, the medianoche is made on soft, sweet egg dough Ooh, yes, bread. Yes. Similar to challah. That's it, dude. Holla. So well, good. I'm glad we got to the bottom of it. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Pass Gas. Hey. Nolan's not introing anybody, I'm so not. I guess I'll do it. My well, name is James Murphy. <laughs> As always, joined by my co-host, Nolan Sykes. Hey. <laughs> Get yourself a sandwich, kid. <laughs> <laughs> and Joe, Joseph Weber. Uh, oh, I don't have an intro this time. I'm so hungry right now. I am actually quite peckish at the moment it's we not just, even noon you guys we just you got the a bagel when we got here. i know i did but <laughs> and dude, a protein bar podcasting takes it out of me it does i guess so yeah this is our second pod that we've recorded today yeah sometimes we double up so i've got nothing new to bring this week what was our running joke last time the dick barber dick barber yeah. nolan started surfing he's really yeah, annoying yeah. about it ah. <laughs> <laughs> that, those were it and i got nothing besides sandwich recommendations I just spent a week at a lake. I'm a jet ski king. <laughs> Was that your first time riding a jet ski? No. No. I'm not okay. At all. No. <laughs> Would you believe that I've never driven a jet ski? Yeah. 
Really? Whoa. Man, you, gotta you guys got to come to the lake with me. I'll show you what it's all about. I'm a jet ski king. As a Wisconsin, I, I feel the need to bring this out. Minnesota touts themselves as as a state of 10,000 lakes. Uh-huh. Wisconsin has 13,000. Oh! Whoa. Put Shots that on the fired. State seal, dude. Minnesota, Joe Weber hates you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, today we're going to talk about uh, Juan Manuel Fangio. Fangio. Important that I get the pronunciation correct. Uh, definitely one of the the early goats of Formula One. Yeah, they call me the Fangio of jet skiing. <laughs> <laughs> they do. I've heard that. Mm-hmm. Did you get kidnapped in Minnesota? I did. How did it end? Um, you'll have to wait for the book. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's just get right into it. Juan Manuel Fangio was born in Argentina to Italian immigrants on June 24th, 1911. He had a very modest upbringing, as his mother was a housekeeper and his father a stonemason's apprentice. As a child, Juan was very athletic and had a real talent for soccer. The other kids all called him El Tueco, or the bandy-legged one, (laughs) because of his special ability to bend a soccer ball off his foot to give it an arc. Bend it like Beckham. Bend it like Fangio. Bandy like Fangio. (laughs) Bandy like Fangio. Juan Manuel was one of six children, so money was a little tight. At just 13 years old, Fangio dropped out of high school and got a job as a mechanic's assistant. Up to that point, he had only really known family, church, and soccer. This exposure to cars brought out a whole new obsession for him. And thanks to the elasticity of his teenage brain, he was able to soak in a lot of knowledge very quickly. By 16 years old, Juan was a mechanic, and on occasion, he'd act as a chauffeur for some of the more affluent customers. But in 1932, after completing his country's compulsory military service at the age of 22, Fangio was torn about what direction to take his life in. He thought soccer was his passion, so he accepted an offer to play for a club in Mar del Plata. However, playing professional soccer, he realized that he really missed cars. After some encouragement from his teammates, he started building a custom car in his parents' shed. God, can you imagine just being like torn between being really good at driving or being really good at soccer? I feel like that's like Zach Job's kind of life. He's so talented, so dynamic that he could have done anything. Yeah, he's really good at pool. Yeah, mm-hmm. and golf. Skateboarding. Skateboarding, working on cars, having cool hair. Hosting shows. Yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. Man. Damn. Imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremiah is. Jeremiah too. too. Yeah. Yeah. Jeremiah can dunk. Yeah, Very athletic, ride smart motor as shit cycles, smart as scientists. He can't do a kickflip yet, though. Yet, but yet. he started skateboarding when he was like 35. And yeah. He's good. <laughs> he's going to be the Paul Newman of skateboarding. <laughs> oh, nice. He's uh, definitely the closest thing we have to Iron Man here at Donut. <laughs> and that makes me the thing. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> From Fantastic Four? Yeah. Different okay. universe, right? No. No. Same. Really? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Were the Fantastic Four part of the Avengers or no? no? No, because I think Fox or something owned the property, not Marvel. Oh. But now Marvel does again. But now Marvel, it's all under the Disney. So mm-hmm. now, like, they're trying to cast the Fantastic Four. No, they have. They have? Yeah, the guy from The Office is... The bandy-legged man? Oh, that's man? right. They had... That yeah, was in Multiverse the bandy of legged Madness. Man. In Multiverse of Madness, they had Jim as yeah. Dr. He uh, is, yeah. So you got the you got the hunk, you got the bandy legged man. He's the bandy legged man. Clear woman. The clear woman <laughs> is Emily. Is a uh, is it Emily Blunt? Oh, John Krasinski. Are they gonna do real that? Real wife. Yeah. Hmm. It's, so when they kiss, everyone's not like gross. Yeah. It's like they're married. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. You don't have to pretend for that one. Mm-mm. Yeah. Uh, I guess that kiss will be very authentic because they love each other. So I can't wait. Yeah. What's the fourth Avenger? The uh, Mr. Torch. Fire. Oh. And then Chris Evans is going to play him. Mr. Fuego. <laughs> Hot Fuego. Michael B. Jordan played him, too. <laughs> That's right. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. They had Miles Teller in there. Anyway. Miles Teller played the bandy-legged man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a Bloomhouse horror movie. The bandy-legged the man. The bandy-legged man. Yeah. Soon thereafter, uh, you know, building the custom car, Juan fully embraced his inner gearhead and opened up his own small garage. It was there that he began to tinker with the knowledge he gained as a young mechanic. He'd test out his custom-made cars and casually race them against friends or local drivers. 
he usually won. Not only were his cars the fastest, but he also discovered a natural talent for driving. In 1936, at 25 years old, Juan took the terrifying plunge into the world of professional motorsport. This wasn't a dip into the shallow end either. This was the South American Rally Circuit. These were long courses, often thousands of miles, through conditions that seemed impossible to traverse. Yeah, lots of lions on the road. <laughs> oh, Joe. <laughs> Am I wrong? Am I wrong? <laughs> Prove he's wrong. <laughs> prove it. I guess we got to go to South America. Okay, there you go. Yeah, you have you ever it. seen a Diane Word video? There's lots of no, lions on the road. South American, not South Africa. Oh, my God. I thought, you were, <laughs> I thought you were doing a bit, and I was playing along. <laughs> egg on my face. All right. Uh, ostrich egg. Am I right? Ostrich egg. <laughs> what? <laughs> All right. The first major victory of Juan's career happened at the 1940 Gran Premio del Norte. The course was simple. Start in Buenos Aires, drive to Lima, Peru, and then back to Buenos Aires. But simple is not synonymous with easy. This was 6,250 miles. Oh, my God. The American equivalent of driving from San Diego, California to Portland, Maine, and back. It was a grueling 15-day race through scorching hot deserts, humid rainforests, and snowy high-altitude mountains. These events were insanely dangerous. Just changing a tire could get a person killed. The shifts in altitude affected not only a driver's alertness, but also their judgment. And after 109 hours of driving, while only eating garlic cloves and cocoa leaves... Yes, what? That's on him. <laughs> Juan was the first to cross the finish line to win the 1940 Argentine National Championship. Dude, can you imagine sharing a tent with that guy? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, cocoa leaves... I think it's like coca leaves. Yeah. So he's all sped up and he stinks. Yeah. <laughs> like a vampire slayer. <laughs> yeah. uh, Juan would go on to win it again the next year, which elevated his name in the motorsports world. Hey, yeah, there's this guy who eats garlic and drives <laughs> yeah. over mountains. We have bread. <laughs> there's this meth head who smells like garlic. It smells like spaghetti. By the time Juan was invited to join the prestigious Formula U circuit in 1948, he was the oldest driver at 37 wow. years old. Wow. That's, I old. never realized that. <laughs> guys, back to back. Old guy stories. Old guys driving cars. I think I might go pro. Yeah. Despite his very late age for racing, Fangio had an advantage over his younger competition. Years on the incredibly demanding South American rally circuit had given him an immense amount of physical strength, stamina, and prepped his nerves for the difficulties of Formula One. Those are all things that I have. I could bench press a lion. <laughs> Fangio didn't take long to start dominating the competition. His first season, he was very competitive at driving for Simca Gordini. The following year, after switching to a Maserati 4CLT-48, he won four races. Car hopping would become a trademark characteristic of Juan's career, even at a time when it was common for drivers to stick with a specific team. For example, Alberto Ascari was Ferrari. Mercedes had Sterling Moss. Juan Manuel Fangio, however, was more of a mercenary than a company man. He drove for five different companies in eight years. This gave him agency over his career, and many of the team owners resented him for it. I mean, I could see that because he like try to lock him in, but you know that if you even your car even falters for like one or two races, he's gonna start looking elsewhere. It's very important for a company to lock down their talent so that they can make long term plans. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine if Scar is just like? I wish I could have drive for someone else other than a Ferrari, but it rhymes. <laughs> Ascari, Ferrari, it's too perfect. <laughs> Fangio's gifts as a driver and mechanic really popped once he got his hands on the wheel of the much more sophisticated machines in Formula One. He was known for his control and willingness to slow down when necessary. He rarely wrecked. Resurrecting his childhood nickname, El Chueco, Fangio's signature move was a four-wheel drift that would help him negotiate corners with exciting flair. That's so sick. Like a bandy car. Yeah, he's the bandy car man. <laughs> and because of this, fans loved watching Juan drive. That style plus his genuine nice guy persona made him a lot of fans, including fellow drivers. His rival and sometimes teammate, self-proclaimed F-boy Sterling Moss, <laughs> once said of Fangio, most of us who drive quickly are bastards. 
but I can't think of any facets of Warren's character which one wouldn't want to have in his own. Wow. For real, for real. For real, for <laughs> real. Respectively. <laughs> no Next. offense, dude, but I think you're kind of whack. Respectively, no I think Warren has a girlfriend at home. <laughs> <laughs> in 1951, at 40 years old and now driving with Alfa Romeo, Fangio would finally figure out how to consistently win in Formula One. After winning three events and placing second in two, he was in position to win the Drivers' World Championship, heading into the final race in Spain. Fangio passed the season favorite Alberto Ascari on the fourth lap and never looked back. He had won his first Formula One championship. Huh? Ascari's but, like, I wish he would have looked back. I at wish me. he would have looked back. I'm a making eyes at him. <laughs> <laughs> if he a looks a back, it means it's a meant to be. <laughs> <laughs> But over the next two years, Fangio's championship season started to seem like a fluke. He was unable to finish the 1952 season because of a broken neck he suffered in a race in Monza. Ooh. Oh, way to not be committed. <laughs> then, when he returned in 1953, he didn't sniff victory until the final race. <laughs> These two challenging seasons brought on calls for retirement. Juan was 43 years old, or two years older than Nolan, <laughs> and he'd spent almost two decades as a professional race car driver. He'd won an F1 championship and garnered fame and admiration. He could easily return home and never have to buy another drink in Argentina again. But he knew he could win another championship. If Juan was going to do it, there could be no half measures. So he doubled down and recommitted himself. He developed a strenuous fitness routine to keep his older body in peak condition and studied car mechanics and engineering until his brain hurt. <laughs> <laughs> he became an absolute dilf. <laughs> <laughs> the fruits of his labor would then unleash a level of excellence never before seen in Formula One racing. We've talked about Juan in a couple episodes, and I think he was like one of the first to get those like really regimented yeah like train in the off season and yeah like keep his athlete. stamina yeah. up dilf stuff you know, dilf stuff dilf stuff in 1954 juan signed with mercedes and drove the w196 monoposto it was a state-of-the-art vehicle that used desmodromic valves and oh we talked about that in uh b2b in bumper to bumper and yeah on uh ducati mm-hmm that created uh, a direct fuel injection. Hmm. The turbocharged engine was adapted from a World War II Whoa. German ooh, fighter plane and could reach speeds of up to 185 miles per hour. I didn't let they. I didn't know that they let them hold on to anything. <laughs> yeah. Now, for the audience at home, just pause the podcast, Google search Mercedes W196, and then imagine going 185 in that thing. Yeah, but if you're currently driving, which I imagine a lot of you are. Don't do what Nolan just Pull said. Pull over and show your boss when you get to the office. Equipped with the fastest car he'd ever driven and in the best physical shape of his life, Juan grabbed Formula One by the throat and refused to let go, just like Garrett when he's kissing Sarah on F-Boy Island. Uh, are you on season one? I just, I watched it this week. Oh, man. Yeah, I'm on season two. Season two is good. Season one's better. Really? We'll see. Well, Okay. Okay. Do you like CJ? Mm hmm. She's my favorite. Does she, I guess she comes back, you're telling me? No, no, no. The other people will come back, though. Well, Garrett and Casey just came back. He tore through the competition in 1954 to win the final three races of the season, taking home his second world championship. In 1955, Fangio won three of his first four races, giving him an almost insurmountable lead over other drivers. It was clear that he and Mercedes were on their way to another world championship. But then one of the worst tragedies in motorsport history oh, occurred. Oh, this is a bad one. Big old thanks to BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. Everyone has different challenges in life. Sometimes you get stuck focusing on the problem and not trying to find a solution. It can be tough to train your brain to stay in problem-solving mode when facing a challenge in life. A couple months ago, my car just died on probably the worst highway you could ever die on, the 110 in LA. I was freaking out. It was one in the morning and I had to mentally walk myself backwards from spiraling out of control. And that's hard for a lot of people. 
But when you learn how to find your own solutions, there's no better feeling. A therapist can help you become a better problem solver, making it easier to accomplish your goals no matter how big or small. I think therapy is super valuable. I think everyone should try therapy at some point in their life. Personally, I think BetterHelp is the best way to get into therapy for someone who's new to it. It's convenient, it's accessible, affordable, and entirely online. You don't even have to go into an office or anything. You can get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey and switch therapists at any time. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash PassGas today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash PassGas. Thanks, BetterHelp. Thanks to Stitch Fix for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. If you're like me, I hate shopping. It sucks. Especially if you have to go with your girlfriend. It feels like it drags on for hours. You end up sitting down, going on your phone. It's really just a pain in the butt. And that's where Stitch Fix comes in. Stitch Fix is the easy way to get clothes that fit you without having to endlessly scroll through options. All you have to do is answer a few questions about where you typically get your clothes from, what you like to wear, and your price range. With your choices in mind and a wide range of sizes available from extra small to 3XL, Stitch Fix will find your perfect fit and send you clothes handpicked just for you. They've got you covered with over 1,000 brands and styles you know and love. And they'll show you how to wear head-to-toe outfits so you can get dressed up and just go. I went on Stitch Fix and filled out the little survey. It felt like they really understood my style and they also offered stuff that I at first wasn't comfortable wearing, but as soon as I put it on, I was like, oh, this is pretty tight. I got this like burnt orange thermal, which is, if you know me, is not really my style, but I put it on and I felt like a new person. I wear it all the time now. And right now, Stitch Fix is offering my listeners $20 off their first fix at stitchfix.com slash gas. That's stitchfix.com slash gas for $20 off today. Stitchfix.com slash gas. For the 1955 24 Hours of Le Mans, Mercedes had created the fastest, lightest, and most aerodynamic car yet. It was called the 300 SLR, and it was basically the previous year's W196 model equipped with massive upgrades. They turned the 2.7 liter engine into a full three, and they made the car lighter using a magnesium alloy body. This gave it greater acceleration than any other car at the track. It also came with giant drum brakes and a rear wind brake with the hopes that it would slow the car down just as fast as it could accelerate. So, wow, it uses, like, active aerodynamics. That's pretty sick. Yeah, but this... Uh, <laughs> I mean... But this, I mean, it's basically like an airplane flap yeah. like on a wing, if you imagine how those work. It mm-hmm. wasn't the car's fault, though. It was just the other car. Early in the race, Juan Manuel had just been passed by his teammate, Pierre Levet. LeVay, still new to driving the SLR, misjudged its acceleration capabilities. When the driver in front of him, Lance Macklin, braked to pit, LeVay couldn't slow down in time. He overrode Macklin's car, and his 1,986-pound SLR was launched into the stands, where it exploded on impact. LeVay was killed instantly, and pieces of his car became dangerous shrapnel flying in every direction, and as a result, 83 spectators perished, and another 170 were seriously injured. If you see footage of this crash, you can see the engine kind of pop out from under the hood. You can see the hood itself spinning like a freaking, like a boomerang almost into the crowd. This is the automotive equivalent of like the Hindenburg. Yes. It's just like so gruesome and terrible. Yeah, not not good, not good. Mercedes was immediately blamed for the incident, which had quickly been coined the Le Mans disaster. The company found itself in the midst of a public relations nightmare. So Mercedes quickly pulled its vehicles from the circuit, from all motorsports, really. However, it was quickly found that it was actually the track that was at fault. At over 30 years old, it hadn't evolved with the technology of the cars and wasn't capable of handling such high speeds. A tragedy like the Le Mans disaster was essentially inevitable because there wasn't like a pit road or anything like that. You had yeah. to pull off the track and the pits were like immediately on the side of the circuit. So. Wasn't it at the end of like the longest straight too? Uh, I think it was right after after a turn and then coming into that main straight. Okay. Yeah. It's like getting on the 110 from Highland Park. Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> Consequently, many nations, including France, West Germany, Spain, and Switzerland, canceled their Grand Prix and banned motorsports until racetracks could develop higher safety standards. In the U.S., the United States Automotive Club was born, 
and became the main officiator of race sanctioning. We talked about that in our IndyCar slash cart slash whatever the heck you want to call it episode. The one good thing to come from the tragedy was a global effort to make racing safer for everybody. A lot of manufacturers pulled out of racing altogether, too, because they didn't want to be associated with this. Yeah. This is at a time where they had just started wearing helmets, Mm -hmm. and there were, like, straps, like lap belts. Mm Mm-hmm. And a lot of race car drivers were like, I don't want to wear a lap belt. If because I, they still had to run to get into their car. Well, they, they thought that they would be safer if they got th- thrown from the car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With so many races canceled, Juan, who had already held a substantial lead, would easily win the world championship. But his team, Mercedes, stopped production on the 300 SLR and pulled out of racing completely. By the way, in May of 2022, the 1955 Mercedes 300 SLR became the most valuable car in history, selling at auction for a world record $143 million. Uh, I bought it. <laughs> just a little treat to myself. Yeah, just a little, hey, pick me up. Use it as like a desk. Yeah, I'm getting it turned into a bed. <laughs> <laughs> With Mercedes now out of racing, freelance Fangio joined Ferrari for their 1956 season. After another steadily dominant season, Juan collected his fourth world championship, the third in a row. This win officially established him as the best driver on the planet. Sterling Moss, who was never short of compliments for Juan, said in an interview, quote, He was the best bloody driver. The cheapest method to becoming a successful Grand Prix team was to sign up Fangio. Juan's car hopping would anger Ferrari in 1957 when he left to join Ferrari's arch nemesis, Maserati. Ferrari accused Juan of trying to position himself to drive the best car each year. In response, Juan chose to drive the older Maserati 250F, which was the same car he drove to his second championship win in 1954. Once again, the 46-year-old laid waste to his competition and went on to win his fifth and final world's driver championship. This feat elevated his status from the best living driver to the greatest driver in motorsports history. Wow. At the time. Juan Manuel handily won the first event of the 1958 Formula One season in his home country of Argentina. Still in top shape, he looked primed for yet another championship. Before the second race in Monaco, however, Fangio agreed to compete in the second annual Cuban Grand Prix, an exhibition that he had won the previous year. But as he arrived in Havana in late February, Juan would soon realize that not everybody in Cuba wanted to see him drive. And I forgot how hungry I was until just then. In 1958, the nation of Cuba was in a state of turmoil. The country known for its stunning landscapes, pastel architecture, and rich African and Spanish-infused culture had been riddled with corruption since the early 1900s. By the late 1950s, it had been fully engulfed by the dark monster that citizens around the world fear most, totalitarian rule. Yeah, leading up to this is basically the casinos that ran everything. Like, they were all mobbed up, all connected here. Back, You know, they had connections here uh, in the U.S. Um, they And overseas, like, it, the, if it didn't benefit the casinos over there, mm. it probably wasn't on the agenda. And, you know, people were getting a little tired of that. The current president, Fulgencio Batista, was a former military officer who was heavily involved in the 1933 coup d'etat known as the Revolt of the Sergeants. Using populist and pro-worker talking points, he strategically maneuvered his way up the government hierarchy until he became the de facto head of state. (laughs) For Cuba, things only got worse. Thanks to financial, political, and military support from the United States, Batista felt emboldened enough to establish a brutal right-wing military dictatorship. As a tyrant, he wasn't unique in his approach or his reasoning. He stripped valuable civil rights from his people and created a large network of secret police to instill fear. If that wasn't already cliche enough, he did it all so he could steal money from his own country's people. Batista aligned himself with the wealthiest Cuban landowners and sugar plantation owners. He profited from selling off 70% of the sugar industry, 90% of Cuban mines, and 80% of its public utilities to the American multinational corporations. In an effort to establish Havana as the Latin Las Vegas, he cozied up to gangster Lucky Luciano and the Italian-American mafia. He allowed them to run drugs, gambling, and most notably sex work all through Havana. At its peak, Havana had over 11,000 sex workers and 270 brothels. Finding drugs there was described as 
being as easy as finding rum, which is easy in Cuba. <laughs> <laughs> this turned the city into an illicit playground for America's wealthy. Batista was pocketing as much as 10% of the profits, which has been estimated to be around $700 million. Wow. All of this came with a price, the massive suffering of the Cuban people. Louis A. Perez Jr. wrote in his book on becoming Cuban, daily life had developed into a relentless degradation. With the complicity of political leaders and public officials who operated at the behest of American interests, as society deteriorated, the calls for a socialist-style revolution became more amplified, and the person leading the charge was a young civil rights lawyer named Fidel Castro. In 1955, after spending almost two years in prison for a failed attempt to overthrow the government, Castro was a free man. I was just thinking, oh man, it's weird that you only get two years for trying to overthrow the government. And then I was like, yeah. oh. And I, I thought the exact same thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, some, some people got like five years. Oh, <laughs> uh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> years earlier, on July 26, 1953, Castro and 165 rebels attempted a coup d'etat. It was a rushed and poorly planned attack that left many in his group dead and the rest thrown in prison. Castro's attempt at revolution had been so clumsy that he had been deemed harmless to Batista's ambitions and was released early. Never let them know your next move. Yeah, history would prove this would be a terrible miscalculation by the dictator. Instead of giving up on his dream of liberation, Castro spent his time in prison rededicating himself to the plight of the Cuban people and started a new group called the 26th of July Movement. It was named after the date of his failed revolution. He didn't want anybody to forget the failure, including himself. Once he was free, Castro, his brother Raul, and an Argentine doctor named Ernesto Che Guevara wasted no time spreading their message. They accumulated small bands of rebels who were disenfranchised and dedicated to the revolution and began to wage an almost five-year guerrilla-style war against Batista's government. In response, Batista censored the media and substantially grew the size of his secret security force. This would usher in a level of tension and violence that would have Cuba on the edge of collapse. To make sure the message was heard, Batista's security forces tortured and brazenly murdered citizens who opposed them. They publicly executed over 20,000 innocent Cuban people in just a few years. The quickly expanding global media caught wind of the dictator's brutality. Backlash from the negative publicity was starting to put pressure on the Batista government and giving credence to Castro's movement. Taking a page from the dictator's handbook, Batista decided to try and control the scope of the situation by utilizing one of humanity's oldest unifying elements, sports. Now, like Hitler before him with the Olympics, Batista thought the nature of competition could act as a distraction, much like Donald Trump being the peak example of optimum male performance. And a well-curated event with recognizable celebrities and wealthy elite could promote Cuba as not just a healthy society, but one worth spending money in. Enter Formula One Racing. Oh, it's like a thing that still happens today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in 1957, Batista hosted the first annual Cuban Grand Prix. It was a massive F1 exhibition with tens of thousands of people lined up for miles along the coastline. Millions. Around the world witnessed the sport's most popular star, Juan Manuel Fangio, run away with victory. The event was the talk of the whole world. Batista was so excited, he immediately planned to do it again the following year and asked Fangio to return and defend his title. If Batista felt empowered before, he now felt untouchable. Meanwhile, the success of Batista's Cuban Grand Prix in 57 left Castro furious. Politics is a game of public perception, and the world had bought into Batista's thin veneer of prosperity. Castro's movement now looked like an illegitimate overreaction. He couldn't allow the second annual Cuban Grand Prix to run so smoothly. When he learned that Juan Manuel Fangio would be returning for the race, he knew exactly how to embarrass Batista. He'd prevent the world's most famous race car driver from ever participating. <laughs> Hey, big old thanks to Valvoline for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. Did you know that Valvoline sponsors Donut's own Adam Knappick in Formula, Dr in Formula Drift? It's true. I use Valvoline in my cars, but, you know, I'm not an FD driver. But Adam is, and he also uses Valvoline 
One of the products that Adam uses is FlexFill. It's got a flexible pouch packaging that's super easy to get into small spaces and it produces less waste. This is honestly the best gear oil you could buy. The packaging is awesome. It's like a Capri Sun. You're squirting on your, uh, your gears and your differentials, whatever. It contains limited slip, which is excellent friction modifier for optimal performance of the clutch pack. This gear oil is so versatile, so easy to use. Highly recommend it. So if you're rebuilding anything on your car, go ahead and get Valvoline FlexFill gear oil. It works great, super easy to use. Go grab it. Thanks, Valvoline. Fangio's kidnappers didn't want to draw any attention to themselves, so they drove slowly through the streets of Old Havana. Each of the getaway cars had three rebels in it, and one of the cars, a black Plymouth, carried the precious cargo that was Juan Manuel Fangio. Oscar Lucero, the gunman from the hotel, sat next to him. While pointing the pistol, Lucero profusely apologized for the inconvenience and was adamant that no harm would come to Juan. Maybe after this, uh, maybe we could be friends after this. I don't know. Listen, man, like you got snapped. No hard feelings. Uh, this is just like ah. <laughs> <laughs> Lucero wasn't lying. His orders were first to keep Juan from attending the race, and second, keep him comfortable, happy, and safe. The apartment where Juan was held had nicer amenities than his hotel. He was fed expensive steak, given a comfortable bed, and had a radio to listen to which was like a TV of the time. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like an iPad. Yeah. <laughs> Castro was trying to lead a revolution, so there was no strategic advantage to killing one of the most beloved sports heroes in Latin America when he needed people on his side. Batista, on the other hand, went full scorched earth. He sent his security forces out to comb the city and its surrounding areas. He closed the airport. They searched all night, interrogating witnesses, arresting innocent people, and causing general terror. By morning, Fangio's kidnapping was on the cover of every major newspaper in the world. Just as Batista had wanted, all eyes were indeed on Cuba. But instead of the race, they were talking about the country's failed leadership. Once the initial shock of being abducted wore off, something peculiar happened to Fangio. He found himself growing fond of his captors. Stockholm he, Syndrome. He could relate to their circumstances. Growing up in Argentina, he had witnessed firsthand the woes that come with living in an unsteady society. He didn't believe them to be violent men, just desperate for a better life. Juan would go on to refer to them as my kind of friendly kidnappers. <laughs> for the rebels, the feeling was mutual. Fangio's affable and kind nature had charmed them. A few hours before the start of the race, the rebels picked up a radio signal from Bautista to his head of security. The humiliated leader ordered the forces to find the rebels and Fangio and kill them all. Fangio dying was the only way Batista felt he could gain back control of the situation and turn public opinion in his favor. The stupid. Realizing Fangio was no longer safe with them, the rebels' mission changed. The men who had abducted Juan from the safety of his hotel now ironically needed to figure out a way to protect him from the president of Cuba. I find my heart bending like my leg <laughs> <laughs> to embrace my captors. After a 90-minute delay, Batista ordered the Cuban Grand Prix to move forward without its defending champion. But the race would only last six laps before disaster would strike yet again. Cuban driver Armando Garcia Cifuentes hit an oil spill and lost control of his Ferrari 500 TR. He careened off track and went flying into the stands, injuring 30 people and killing seven. Even in his worst nightmares, Batista couldn't have conjured up such a catastrophic outcome. After being held for 27 hours, Fangio was secretly dropped off at the Argentine embassy, unharmed. Lucero told him, quote, When the revolution triumphs, you will be our guest of honor. While Cuba's security forces were still searching for Juan, he held a press conference to confirm he was free and okay. He dismissed the idea that he was in any danger and even threw his support behind the rebels. If what the rebels did was in a good cause, then I, as an Argentinian, accept it. We got on well. They were just making a political point. That is incredible. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. He does seem really nice. Dude, I want to hang out with Fangio. With the Fonge? You want to hang out with the Fonge? <laughs> I want Fangio to be my, like, father-in-law. Yeah, that'd be sick. Yeah. That is an incredible quote, man. Yeah. Wow. Batista's regime never fully recovered after Fangio's abduction. The country would be handed over to Fidel Castro's communist regime within the year. 
Fangio retired from racing just a few months later without finishing the 58th season. He had accomplished more than any Formula One driver before him and felt he had nothing left to prove. He also went on to have a sentimental relationship with Cuba for the rest of his life and returned in 1981 to meet with Fidel Castro. Wow. On his 80th birthday, Fangio received an odd-looking card in the mail. When he opened it, it read, Happy Birthday, from your friends, the kidnappers. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy, man. Wow. It seems pretty improbable that a story like Juan Manuel Fangio's could ever happen again. The composition of his unpredictable yet thrilling life seems like Forrest Gumpian folklore. That's Gumpian in nature, That's baby. Gumpian, dude. <laughs> he grew up too poor to even finish high school, yet ended up a millionaire. He started Formula One at an age when most drivers retire, yet he won more championships than his peers, five in eight years. He ushered in a pervasive feeling of driver empowerment by working where and for who he wanted to. He survived a broken neck, the worst disaster in motorsport history, and was a political ploy during a violent conflict. And he retired with the reputation as the greatest driver in history. Pretty amazing. Juan Manuel Fangio's name is forever etched into the pages of both record and history books. Some would say those might be the same book. Well, <laughs> sports and regular history. <laughs> and he did it all with a grace and modesty that made him beloved by everyone, including rivals, dictators, and kidnappers. When Fangio was released to the Argentine embassy by his captors, the first thing he said to the media couldn't put in more simply. Well, this was one more adventure. That's Dang. pretty amazing. Pretty cool guy. Cool Ultimate life. father-in-law, probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Wow. Um, I'm just, like, thinking now... Uh, how, you know, the, uh, Batista used Formula One as kind of like to launder its mm -hmm. reputation, mm -hmm. much like a lot of places do today. But, like, the main difference now is, like, I think drivers back then probably kind of turned a blind eye to a lot of stuff. Yeah. And just were there, I'm just here for the racing. But nowadays. Or they kind of, uh, most of the them majority do of them it do. now, too. Well, I'm saying the difference now is that you have superstars like Sebastian Vettel yeah. and Lewis Hamilton uh, and a few others of the younger guys like George Russell now like openly wearing like pride flags on their helmets in, in countries, in countries that, like Saudi Arabia yeah. and Azerbaijan and Hungary, which are like pretty rough places if you're uh, LGBTQ. So I think that the nature of being a race car driver uh, it has changed a lot, but we have guys like Juan Manuel to thank for that and uh, always kind of uh, – Fighting for what's right, you know. Yeah, he always had agency. It seemed like, mm -hmm. and just got along with everyone. Yeah, you can't which tell is... me what to do. I'm fucking one man. <laughs> yeah, you me? I'm 46. So like, yeah. what are you gonna do? Exactly. Fire that me? probably helps a lot too. Honestly, yeah. yeah. You know who you are at that point. Yeah. Tell me what to do, casino guy. Anyway, yeah, casino uh, thank guy. you. I'm almost 50, dog. <laughs> <laughs> you think I'm scared of you, bitch? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I don't know. I do have eight guns. <laughs> All right, so we have some fan mail this week. This one comes from Lauren, longtime listener here, first time emailer. Just wanted to do a shout out of appreciation. I've watched countless videos from Donut, love the merch, and listen to podcasts every week. I ran a marathon a while back and had a past gas. Okay, cool. And had past gas on the entire race. Whoa, it was that the best cool. fuel for that run and kept me laughing, which Dude, I think that means we've run a marathon. Help, it's help true. me run faster. <laughs> hey, keep it juiced, yeah. Lauren. Wow. Hell yeah, Wink Wink Nation. Dang, dude, that's sick. Uh, thank you so much for your email. If you'd like to reach out to the show, hit us up at passgas at donutmedia.com. Maybe we'll read your email on the air. Um, I'm going to start training. No, I'm not. I hate running so much. No, but October 22nd, I will swim around the Venice Pier. Uh, there will be live music. It's going to be so cold. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get him a rash guard. It'll be all right. Oh, right. cool surfer. <laughs> cool surfer <laughs> term. That's what we call shirts. All right. Follow James at James Pumphrey on all social media. Check out Except his TikTok. Except TikTok, where I'm the where I'm Kentucky Cobra. That's right, Kentucky Cobra. Follow and if you are James Pumphrey at TikTok, email us because I want it back. <laughs> follow Joe at Joe G Weber. And follow me at Nolan J. Sykes. Uh, in the meantime, uh, be kind. Keep it juiced. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye. <laughs>